Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Divine Program of the World's History this book by Albert Close, and I'm joined here with Michael and Yerk Lisman in Europe, and I'm here in the United States, in central northern United States here in Minnesota, and we are discussing and reading, reading and discussing actually, Yerk is reading and we are discussing the different points of history now in the second portion of the book which is the divine program of European history, very specifically. Very interesting reading here. And, Björk, are we on page what? I forget now. I think it's 21, if I'm not mistaken, at the top of the page. Uh, 21 in the book, in the PDF, it's page 54. You are correct, as it is shown in the picture here. Beautiful. All right. So I'm ready to go. And Michael, welcome. Yeah. Hello, Brett. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to our next reading of this quite interesting and quite small book, which is very much interesting in my humble opinion, and it quite fits to this underrating gentleman I'm now connected with, with on this underrated Christian channel that you are running. So let me yeah, let me uh, stop talking and uh, yeah, let's let me enjoy this reading. Good, let's go right into the reading. As Brett says, 
on page 21 in the second part of the book and page 54 in the PDF of 168. So we are coming close to one third of the book reading up to now. We were speaking about how the Jesuits, uh, we cited that uh, on, the, on the previous page from Alexander Hislop here, um, how the Jesuits were surprised when they came into Asia, into Japan and especially into China and they saw a ch uh, and India also and they saw child and uh, mother and child worship as they of course adopted it um, from Babylon into Christianity, what they at least call Christianity and they were surprised to find the same, uh, the, the, the same worship in the uh, Asiatic countries of course, this is no surprise for anybody who studies the matter as Alexander Hislop did when he wrote his book, because we all know that all these um, religions have the same root, and they're coming out of Babylon. And they took the mother and son worship from Babylon into Asia, which we know today as India and China. And of course, they took the same into Europe via uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome which is finally the kingdom that we are talking about here. Speaking of 1248 in the history of, um, uh, of the development of the beast, of the papal and antichrist system, as we were speaking earlier. So we see here in 1248 AD, and this is today, by the way, the 24th reading we do of this book, another striking proof that worship of the Madonna and her son came from Babylon and not from Palestine, lies in the fact that the Italian Madonna is represented as of fair complexion with golden hair. The Virgin Mary was a Jewess and her son was a Jew. Jewish features are of, uh, are of a type of, uh, and character peculiarly their own, and the hair is invariably black. The remarkable characteristic of the original Italian Madonnas is that they have nothing whatsoever of the Jewish form of features, but they do exactly resemble the Babylonian Madonna as found by Sir Robert Kerr Porter among the ruins of ancient Babylon during his tour in 1870 through 1822. Also, this is taken from Alexander Hislop's book. And what do you think why? The quote-unquote Illuminati chose the singer Madonna as their quote-unquote mother of harlots, <laughs> who is blonde, by the way, huh? just as the Babylonian Madonna is, and nothing like the real mother of Jesus Christ would have looked like, the quote-unquote Virgin Mary, as the, it is worshipped in the Roman Catholic Church, who is not a virgin anymore because she bare sons and um, daughters for her husband, Joseph, after giving the immaculate birth of Jesus Christ before. Most of these Babylonian abominations were cast out of the Reformed Church of Christ at the Reformation. Yeah, and that's a big pity that it says most of these Babylonian abominations were cast out instead of all Babylonian abominations were cast out. It should have read all Babylonian abominations were cast out because you cannot mix the holy with the profane. And the reformers also were not perfect people and they had a mistake here and there and that is why only most of the Babylonian abominations were cast out of the Reformed Church of Christ at the Reformation. For example, they kept the cross. But that's a whole other subject. <laughs> Many festivals, uh, the author continues, Many festival days still observed are old pagan festivals. Christmas Day is not the day of on which our Lord was born. It was an old pagan festival and the Church of Rome tacked the name of Christ onto it and we still observe it as if it were the true date of Christ's birth. Easter and the sacred acts, extreme unction, the confessional, purgatory and prayers for the dead, idol processions, relic worship, clothing and crowning of images, the rosary and the worship of the sacred heart or the holy heart, the sovereign pontiff, college of cardinals, celibate priests, monks and nuns, 
All these came from ancient Babylonian worship. Now, if you want to see a few videos that I produced in this regard, I can show you something um, right here when it opens cool. up. Um, yeah, hello, open. Uh, we go to. Isn't the irony? Playlist. Isn't this funny? Today yeah. is is Easter Sunday. Yeah, that's what they sell it uh, to the world. Yeah, yeah. Why, Ishtar Sunday. Yeah, that's why I don't even mention it. Yeah. Um, listen, uh, we can go to this playlist here, Babylon Mystery Religion. Um, that is a playlist that I did on the book of Ralph Woodrow that he published in 1966. And uh, as you see, I did uh, 21 videos, 20 videos dealing with the book itself, um, the, which has, I think, about 22 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. Um, chapter 20, The Mystery of the Mixture, uh, 19 videos, I think, of the video. And here, mm. of course, we also have a, uh, because it only speaks here about... Uh, about the chapters, um, it speaks about Christmas, it speaks about Easter, uh, that is for example in chapter 19 if I'm not mistaken, here you have the Winter Festival that speaks about uh, Christmas, and here you have Fish Friday and the Spring Festival that speaks about Easter, so you can go to these videos and have a look at them, and watch me reading and, and follow me on the reading of the book of uh, Ralph Woodrow, Babylon Mystery Religion, which I, uh, I, I don't know, I, I read this book in 2016, 2017, something, so already a time ago. I'm going to read the same book now in German. Uh, I'm going to start that uh, within a week, probably, uh, and do the same all over again. But the book of Alexander Hislop, or let's, let's, let's say it this way, the book of Ralph Woodrow, mirrors a lot of that which is mirrored, uh, which is spoken of by Alexander Hislop in his book. But the book of Ralph Woodrow is a little bit more accessible. It is easier to read, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, Alexander Hislop is a really a hard study book and Ralph Woodrow's book is more accessible, easy to read and to study. And he deals with all that, that, of course, Alexander Hislop deals with here, because this, again, is a quote, as you can see here, on the one that is taken from Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. Yeah? But the two books have the same uh, foundation. Okay? So you have to understand that, of course, our Lord was not born on the 25th of December, the day of the unconquerable sun. Uh, Easter is just a pagan fertility feast it always was this is also by the way a very important point for many people who claim that the king james is not a very good bible because the king james is the only bible to mention easter <laughs> in the book of acts but why does the king james mention easter in the book of acts well I don't even go into that right now, but we did a complete study of the book of Acts in English. We, I mean Brother Michael, who is joined with us here, Brother Brett, who is uh, doing the recording work for us. I mean, I do the recording, but he does all the other work, and he got the book for us. Mm -hmm. And we did a complete study of the book of Acts, and there I also explained why the word Easter is in the King James, and it is only in the King James. And when you have two working brain cells think a little bit and put the word Easter in the King James in relation to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Study that and you understand why the King James is the only Bible to translate the word Pasha in the New Testament into Easter at especially that moment in the book where they do it. It's fascinating. I'm not going to tell you right now but we will see, of course, on the basis of the comments we get in here, whether you did your study on your own or you just take all the criticisms from all the other people who did not study it and are just saying, oh, the King James uses the abominable word of Easter. That is a pagan Bible. No, it is 
the more proof that the King James is the only true word of God because he really puts us to the point when we read this why the King James is using the word Easter in that moment. That's all I'm going to say about that. But maybe Michael or Brett have another word to say on the subject. I think you got it all down there, brother. Yeah. Good. And, Pretty and sure. I can keep a secret. Mm -hmm. You can keep a secret. I can keep a secret, so I won't tell. Yeah, let the people study for themselves. Huh? That's right. So let's continue in the book. 1248 AD, Bonaventura promotes the worship of the Virgin Mary. Pope Alexander IV in 1254 established the Inquisition in France. Well, the Inquisition was already earlier established in the beginning of the 13th century. It started in 1206, but he really took it to the next level. 1268, papal dominion at its utmost height. There was almost no opposition to the ultramontane rule of the Vicar of Christ on Earth, the self-proclaimed Vicar of Christ on Earth, who is the Pope. In 1294, Antichrist Pope Boniface VIII proclaimed that God had set him over kings and kingdoms. He laid France and Denmark under interdicts. And with France he had a very interesting dispute. Because of the Knights Templars, and that led him to the publishing of, that's why I wrote this here, Remember, Remember, 1302, the Bull Unam Sancta. Yeah? Pope Boniface VIII is the one who proclaimed the Bull Unam Sanctum, means mm -hmm. the one and only holy, in which it is stated that, and that was addressed most and for all to the King of France at that time, that all people, all kings, all everybody in the world, it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. That essentially is what's being said in the bull Unam Sanctum that was published in 1302 by Antichrist Pope Boniface VIII that we read about here. <coughs> Sorry. Now in 1309, the state of Europe, when the papal power was at its height, in the year 1309 AD, Antichrist Pope Clement V transferred his court from Rome in Italy to Avignon in the south of France. With the entry of the papal court into France, corruption, immorality and debauchery entered the country. The Holy See taught the French people all sorts of crimes of excess and luxury, not to forget the art of poison. The poet patriarch lived at Avignon and was intimately acquainted with life in the papal court. In his letter he writes, quote, You find there, at the papal court, confusion, darkness and horror. Vice and crime dwell within these precincts. I am only describing unto you what I have seen with my own eyes. I know from experience that you can find here neither piety nor charity, neither faith nor respect nor the fear of God. Nothing sacred and nothing human. Friendship, decency, candor are absolutely unknown here. The hope for a future life is looked upon as a vain illusion. The resurrection the end of the world and Jesus Christ, supreme and absolute judge, is counted among puerile inventions. Love of truth is considered madness. Chastity, boorishness, decency, a shameful stupidity. Licentiousness, on the contrary, is considered greatness of soul, whilst prostitution here leads to fame and celebrity. The more vice one accumulates, the greater the glory. A good reputation is looked upon as something very contemptible. What I am telling you here is known to everybody. These holy, debauched and libidinous, saintly old men, forgetting their age, their position and rank, 
fearing neither name, blame, nor dishonor, spend in banquets and orgies their days, which they ought to have employed in regulating their life after that of Christ. Seems like he speaks of 2019, huh? <laughs> I was going to say, Yerk, <laughs> there's some serious parallels going on, isn't there? Yeah. And today it is with all the child abuse that is actually coming up out in oh. the air. Yeah. When you think of quote unquote Pizza Gate and when you think of all the abominations and um, child abuse facts that come out of the Roman Catholic Church today, more and more out in the open. I mean, they have come out in the open the last 50 years already, but today it is even more and more and more. And, mm-hmm. and But people don't recognize it, you know? Well, uh, almost, I almost think nobody they talks do. about it. They do, however, yeah, it's not uh, kosher to talk about it, at least uh, in the um, in the sense of uh, it's not uh, fashionable. Let's put it that way. Yeah. At all. In fact, you know, it's everything. Oh, your conspiracy theorists kind of BS. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's I time know. to kick that to the curb. No conspiracy is the reality that we live because we are born again Christians who believe Christ came to die and suffer for our sin on our behalf and that his propiti- his propitiation excuse me is sufficient enough and that we live a new life now what we see from what i just read here Brett is just that there is nothing new under the sun yeah perfect Everything that happened here in the beginning of the 14th century that is written down here by the patriarch that lived in Avignon is exactly the same thing the same person could write today. It continues to say in 1309 still, thus the unworthy prelates think to stop time, which is running fast. Satan, with an air of satisfaction, presides at their festivals, regulates their pleasures and constantly finds his seat between the depraved old men and the young virgins, the objects of their nauseous amours. He is surprised to find that their sins by far exceed his temptations. (laughs) Satan is surprised to find that their sins by far exceed his temptations. I shall not speak of violation, rape, adultery and incest. They are trifles at the pontifical court, unquote. And so on the chronicler goes. But what he writes, no man dare print in English today. Now, that is a confirmation of what we just said regarding 2019, instead of Albert Close writing this book in 1916. Dean Millman, in his History of the Latin Christianity, Volume 7, page 453, breaks off his quotations from Petrarch's letters, remarking, quote, I must pause. I dare not quote even the Latin, unquote. Truly, these were the Dark Ages. In 1316 AD, Antichrist Pope John XXII pursues persecution begun by Innocent III. In 1342, Antichrist Pope Clement VI urges forward the persecution of the Vaudois, or Waldenses, as we already learned earlier. In 1374, we have the rise of the morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe. On his return from Rome, he declares his conviction that the Pope is the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. The Reformation thus really originated in Britain, in the nation whose children and offspring afterwards carried the scriptures all over the world. In 1378 AD, Wycliffe translates the New Testament from the Latin and publishes it in English, and arouses the furious anger of the priests. Many readers were burned at the stake with the copies of the scriptures tied around their necks. The Great Schism of the West 
Two popes, Urban VI and Clement VIII, both of whom at the same time claimed to be head of the church and vicar of Christ upon earth. In 1394, Boniface IX and Benedict XIII were Antichrists. And in 1399, Jerome of Prague propagates Wycliffe's teaching in Bohemia. In 1406, Pope Gregory XII is also appointed Pope. Three Popes at one time, Boniface IX, Benedict XIII and Gregory IX. This leads to the Council of Constance, as we will lead, read later on. Three popes at one time. Gregory and Benedict refuse to appear before the Council of Pisa, which appoints a third pope, Alexander V. Each of the three popes had his adherents, and each excommunicated the others. So far, dear brothers and sisters, on papal infallibility. Huh? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 1416. Right. The martyrdom of Sir John Altcastle and Lord Cobham burned as a heretic. And of course, he, he skips the history of the Council of Constance in 1415, where Jan Hus and Jerome were burned. Uh, the Jerome that we read of here in 1399, Jerome of Prague and Jan Hus. And they were both persecuted and burned at the Council of Constance, the Council of Three Popes, where one Pope came out later on. But he speaks of the martyrdom of Sir John Oldcastle and Lord Cobham, burned as a heretic. In 1431, the General Council of Basel in Switzerland, and and of and end of the Great Schism. So in 1431, the Great Schism ended. A second proclaiming of the Holy Scriptures to the world after the Dark Ages. In Revelation chapter 10, verse 11, we read, Thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. So we can understand that the first prophesying against many peoples and nations and tongues and kings was the time that we are reading here, the beginning of the 15th century that ended at the Council of Constance. And the second time, again, was then the real Reformation when it kicked into a higher gear by Martin Luther in the beginning of the 16th century. I just make that up, of course, out of my own understanding. Anyway, in 1438 we have the invention of the art of printing. Yeah. Uh, Gutenberg um, perfected his book printing uh, art in 1455, as far as I know. But of course, there were years going before that where they started already kind of these printing uh, arts. And um, Gutenberg's printing was with the movable letters, so they probably had another kind of book print here before. The little book in Revelation chapter 10, verse 2 was, of course, one of the very first printed books. Huh? The old bulky manuscripts Bible reduced to a little book by printing. The Bible was one of the first books printed, and thus was reduced in bulk to a little book, and at the Reformation was given back to the world from which it had for centuries been withheld by the Church of Rome, as we can read in Revelation chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. The British and Foreign Bible Society and the American Bible Society have together sent out nearly 300 million copies of the scriptures in 446 languages and dialects since 1804 AD. Up to the year 1800 it is estimated that only about 6 million copies had been circulated in only 40 languages. In 1543, we come to the next very important historical fact, that is the fall of Constantinople. And that also, of course, is the end of the Roman Empire that was led out of the East in that time. So now we read of the prophecy of the Saracens and the Turks in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 21. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. 
And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And that torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Uh, when we read here about being tormented five months, we have to understand these five months as a prophetical time. Each month for a year. Five months, 150 days, 150 years. That is something that I read already in another place about um, this very important understanding of the book of Revelation. Maybe the author gets into it a little bit later here too. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth was as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Again, the same 150 prophetic days and years. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. An hour, a day, a month and a year. Now, this is prophetically. And when you count that into years in our world here, you have 360 days plus 30 plus a day, plus the 24th part of a day, which is a fortnight. So you have 391 years and 14 days, when you count this prophetically. This is very important to understand, because when you get real history next to this prophecy, you will understand what persecution was running in those 330, uh, 391 years and 14 days. I'm not going to get into that right now because I did not prepare that, but you know, leaving this up to your own study. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire, and smoke, and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. 
neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Look at the Turkish or Muslim horse tails standards with the crescent moon and the hair like women. This is taken from Eliot's Hore Apocalyptica. Very, very interesting book to read. Let me just check if my camera is running. Yeah. Today, no problem. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Jörg. The arms of a nation are often prefigured in prophecy. In the case of the Turkish power, they were all important. Our greatest historical expositors see in this prophecy a description of a new destroying agency by which the horsemen overcame their enemies. They think it a plain reference to the gunpowder and artillery of the Turks, which was first used at the siege and capture of Constantinople. Again, the frequent mention in this chapter of the horses' tails and the fact that one of the Turkish military emblems is composed of horses' tails surmounted by the crescent, as shown in the above engraving. A Turkish commander once lost his standard in an engagement, and no other being at hand and no other being at hand, he cut off the tail of a horse and suspended it from the point of a spear, and rallied his men around, uh, around it as a banner. Ever after, it was used as a military emblem and standard. Now let the reader now notice briefly, in the order in which they are given, the other striking characteristics of the invading hosts which St. John beheld in this symbolic vision and we shall see how, in the most remarkable manner, they confirm the application of this prophecy to the Turks, and, when taken all together, render the identification complete. A special attention is drawn in verse 16 to two facts impressed upon St. John in his vision of the scourge, namely, that the invading force was composed of horsemen, and that it was exceedingly numerous, or, as it is expressed in Eastern Hyperbole, twice 10,000 times 10,000. Now, precisely these two points are noticed by Gibbon. Now, you know, Gibbon, who was the author of the Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire book. In words which seem the very counterpart of the prophecy, he thus describes the invasion of the Turks, quote, Myriads of Turkish horse overspread a frontier of 600 miles. Unquote. This is taken from Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbon, the book I just mentioned. No less striking is the correspondence of their appearance. St. John says, And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates as of fire, and of jacinth, and of brimstone. Historians tell us that, from their first appearance, the Ottomans have, effect, have effected to wear warlike apparel of scarlet and blue and yellow, the very colour suggested in St. John's description in this vision. He adds that the heads of the horses are as the heads of lions. This is an obvious symbol of the awe-inspiring fierceness of the advancing swarms of cavalry. Now we come to what has constituted the most remarkable feature, and that is the means of destruction employed by the invading horsemen. Saint John just thus describes, sorry, Saint John thus describes what he saw in his vision, quote, and out of their mouth proceeded fire and the smoke of brimstone. By these three plagues was the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouth, unquote, as we read in verses seventeen and eighteen. And this is probably not from the King James Version, because it says here the RV, this must be kind of a revised version of the Bible, so the quotes are not completely King James. It's impossible not to notice that there, by a twofold repetition, special attention is drawn in the inspired record of the vision to a remarkable means of destruction which would come into operation in the course of this scourge, enabling it to effect its purpose of killing the third part of men, as already explained, and therefore selected by divine prescience, prescience, prescience sorry, as a prophetic symbol and characteristic of the judgment. 
Is there anything in history to solve the enigma and to correspond to what John saw in his vision? We think it can be shown that there is. Barnes, also an historical writer, has well remarked on these verses, quote, This is just such a description as would be given to an army to which the use of gunpowder was known. Looking now upon a body of cavalry, armed with firearms or batteries of horse artillery in the heat of an engagement, it would seem, if the cause were not known, that the horses belched forth smoke and sulfurous flame. Unquote. The use of musketry by the Turks in bringing to a successful issue their invasion of the eastern third of the Roman Empire, and thus accomplishing the task assigned to them under this trumpet of killing, the third part of Min, is one of the established facts of history. The novelty and extraordinary nature of such a feature, constituting, as Gibbons remarks, a complete revolution in the art of war, are precisely such as would lead to be especially dwelt upon in the prophetic portraiture. Fire, smoke and sulphur, a chief ingredient in the manufacture of gunpowder, are obviously appropriate for a figurative description of such warfare. Of course St. John knew nothing about this. He simply recorded what he saw. It is for us to interpret. But there is yet a more striking detail to be noticed concerning the means of destruction by which this Turkish scourge succeeded in accomplishing its purpose. St. John thus further describes what he saw in the vision, quote, for the power of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like unto serpents and have heads, and with them they do hurt. Again, this is from the revised version of the Bible taken. Now, and when we go into this little footnote here, it just says that Gibbons mentioned that gunpowder was invented and introduced into warfare about the middle of the 14th century, and that the Turks were not slow to avail themselves of such a means of conquest. This is a passage that we just read, yeah? For the power of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like unto serpents and have heads, and with them they do hurt verse 19 of uh, chapter 9 of the book of Revelation, or chapter 10, what was it? Help me here, chapter 10, right? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds yeah. right. Chapter 10, okay. This is a passage that has caused great perplexity to commentators. Yet the solution, when once we get the clue, seems obvious and clear. In this part of the symbolism, there is indicated a still more terrible means of destruction than the small arms already described, and that is artery, which, as Gibbons tells us, was the chief means by which the capture of Constantinople was effected. We have seen that the horses with lion-like heads and mouth symbolized cavalry, uh, cavalry, sorry, we have seen that the horses with lion-like heads and mouth symbolized cavalry equipped with firearms. But here St. John sees a further means of destruction connected with the tails of the horses as they appeared in the vision. Their tails are like unto serpents and have heads, and with them they do hurt. Now let the reader picture artery going into action, and, he, and the appropriateness of the symbol will be seen at once. Indeed. Comment. Yeah, please. Yeah, that was uh, chapter 9, actually. Yeah, I it was chapter it. 9, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I, uh, I thought I was correct with that, chapter 9. Yeah. Okay. I thought you said 10, but keep yeah, going, please. Fir first, ten, first 10, but I thought it was chapter 9. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah please. Um, indeed, it is difficult to imagine how this potent means of destruction could have been, some 1,300 years before its invention, more strikingly and vividly indicated in conformity with the imagery of the prophetic vision. The cannon dragged behind the horses and swung round in order to open fire and inflict destruction seem obviously to correspond to the tails behind the horses which St. John saw in vision, and of which he says, with them, they do hurt. Dr. Craven in Lange's commentary has some interesting remarks on this, which should carry conviction. 
He says, quote, In Webster's Dictionary, we find the following as the second definition of basilisk. In military affairs, a large piece of ordnance, so called from its supposed resemblance to the serpent of that name or from its size. This cannon carried an iron bow of 200 pounds weight, but is not now used. Such were the cannons with which the Turks moved the assault of Constantinople. These long serpent-like instruments of destruction dragged breach foremost in the rear of the companies that served them might well have been described in symbols as tails like unto serpents having heads. And the power by which the Turkish armies breached the walls of Constantinople and thus subjugated the eastern third of the old Roman Empire, as it is told in chapter 9 verse 18, was in these tails and in the mouths of these heads. Eliot, again from Hore Apocalyptice, gives the above engraving from a contemporary authority of one of these long, old-fashioned cannon ending in an animal's head with an open mouse. Isn't it fascinating how accurate the prophecy of the Word of God 1500 years before already was? To me, this is just incredible. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Dr. Craven adds the further, the further weighty observation, which may be taken to apply not merely to the trumpet series, but to the whole system of the historical interpretation of the book of Revelation, namely that, quote, the resemblance is not merely between the individual symbols and the events which have been adu uh, uh, adduced as fulfilling them respectively, but it is a resemblance between the entire series regarded as a whole and the entire course of history. It extends to the relations of the symbols to each other, their succession and mutual proportions. We come to the next historical fact in 1457, the midst of the 15th century, where we read of the Church of Bohemian and Moravian brethren founded from the remnant of the Hussites little part that the author skipped here, the Hussites, going back to Jan Hus, who was murdered in the Council of Constance in 1450. In 1483 we come to the birth of Luther and William Tyndale. In 1487 Antichrist Pope Innocent VIII inaugurates a crusade against the Waldenses in Piedmont, encouraged by promise of a plenary indulgence in 1487-80. A plenary indulgence is a complete forgiveness of all your sins if you engage in the crusade the Pope orders you to do. So when you go out and kill in the name of the Pope, meaning the God of this world, all your sins will be forgiven by a papal bull in 1487. Oh, so Christopher Columbus um, must have said very much. Yeah, <laughs> you took it away. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. 1498, Savonarola, converted Dominican for preaching necessity to reform the church condemned to death by the order of Antichrist Pope Alexander VI. He was tortured and burned at Florence. Savonarola preached with trumpet voice that Babylon the Great is the church of Rome. Out of the horse's mouth itself it came. Savonarola, I even have a picture of him. Hmm. And... Um, it's interesting to see because he really was a Roman Catholic that turned against his own church, you know? <laughs> yeah, like Alberto Rivera. Yeah, like Alberto yeah. Rivera. Yeah. This is That's right. Girolamo Savonarola at the end of the 15th century. Huh? Wow. He converted. He was, a, he was a Dominican. He converted to Protestantism. By wow. preaching necessity to reform in the church, and he was condemned to death by the order of Antichrist Pope Alexander VI. He was then tortured and burned at Florence, one of the papal states. Savonarola preached with trumpet voice that Babylon the Great is the Church of Rome. So he is also another example of someone who God woke up with his cry 
of Revelation 18.4 Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you do not receive of her plagues, because her iniquities have reached unto heaven. In 1503, then, Pope Alexander VI, or Roderick Borgia, a monster of wickedness, poisoned at a feast by drinking of a bowl his son had prepared for another. Imagination could not conceive such a monster as Alexander. Men go with gold to the palace to buy the mysteries of the faith. Everything can be had for money. Dignities, honors, marriages, dissolution of marriage, divorces. Crimes grosser than Scythian, acts of treachery worse than the Carthaginian, are committed without disguise in the Vatican itself, under the eyes of the Pope itself. There are rapes, murders, incests, debaucheries, cruelties exceeding those of the Neros and Caligulas, meaning of the pagan emperors. None are spared, not even the highest. Licentiousness past description is paraded in contempt of God and man. Sons and daughters are polluted. Harlots and procuresses are gathered together in the mansion of St. Peter. On All Saints' Day, 50 women of the town were invited to dinner. The details of what followed are totally unmentionable. Gold is gathered in, form all, uh, in from all quarters. Indulgences were sold in all churches of Christendom to provide a portion for the Pope's daughter, Lucretia. The son, Caesar Borgia, is, no, is so like his father that it is hard to say which is the greater monster. The cardinals of the better sort, if such there be, are silent or affect not to see. They bought their rank with money, simony. They preserve it with criminal compliance and continue to speak smoothly to the Pope and praise and flatter. When I go back to this um, playlist that I just told you about uh, Babylon mystery religion, we read about what is spoken here about in chapter, I think, uh, 14 or something. Um, it is uh, chapter 12 or 13, the humane, uh, inhumane, uh, uh, inhumane Inquisition, and then, of course, uh, the uh, Lords over God's heritage. So, about uh, chapter 12 through 15 in this book, in this uh, reading of mine, or when you get the book for free online, as you where you can buy it, uh, you can read more extensively about the debaucheries and lasciviousness that is spoken about here, what I just read to you from this book, the beginning of the 16th century, 1503. This description we just read, quoted from Fraud from Burkert's diary, was written a hundred years after Petrarch recorded what he saw at Avignon. When the professed vicar of Christ upon earth lived such a life in the Vatican itself, what must have been the state of the churches of Christendom that, allowed, that followed his teaching and example? When Luther went to Rome in 1510 AD to see the quote-unquote holy city, he declared on his return to Germany that the wickedness that, the, that he witnessed was so awful that if hell be a place, Rome must be built on the top of that infernal abode. These two accounts of the period of the Church of Rome, sorry, these two accounts over the period of the Church of Rome's quote-unquote golden age, when Europe was most Catholic, when the power of the Pope was undisputed, when according to Roman Catholic writers, Catholic civilization produced conditions of life, both moral and material among its people, much superior to that produced by Protestantism that has not been born yet. In 1503, Pope Julius II began the erection of St. Peter's Church at Rome, and in 1513, Pope Leo X, who 
received his tonsure when he was seven years old and who was made a cardinal when he was 13 years of age, this Antichrist Pope Leo X, the one who fought against Martin Luther, his grant of indulgences for crime precipitates the Reformation. Leo X represented himself on papal medals as the Lion of the uh, of the tribe of Judah, thus arrogating to himself a dignity which belongs to our Lord alone. Yeah, that is a that very, sense. very interesting, <laughs> interesting part to read about Pope Leo X. In, in preparation of the book, which I'm starting to read, uh, Babylon, Mystery, Religion and German from next week on, um, I just read through this part of the book, so this is why it is fresh in my mind that he was made a cardinal at 13 years of age. Can you imagine that? Just Talk about a little brat. Yeah, just think. Jeez. Huh? Little okay, kid right waving around a stick. <laughs> So we go here into a little footnote because it says here that produced Protestantism. So here's a little footnote that is almost not to see. It mentions here, see Protestant progress and papal claims and uh, Cameron and Co. and Motherwell. After 400 years of Bible truth circulating in Europe, speaking of beginning of the 16th until the beginning of the 20th century when this book is written, we find the comparative moral stake, state of the Roman Catholic and Protestant countries of Europe reflected in the criminal statistics of each country as follows. At the present time, the criminals condemned yearly for murder per million inhabitants runs. United Kingdom, 5. Ireland, 11. Germany, 11. Belgium. <laughs> that small piece of crap where I live in. 14, France 16, Austria 23, Hungary 67, Spain 83, Italy 95. These figures are the average and extend over a period of 20 years. This means the more Catholic the country gets, the more crime per million inhabitants you have. Criminal statistics are much more reliable than those for illegitim illegitimacy. Illegitimacy. Sorry. Illegitimacy. Yeah, yeah. crazy word. <laughs> Criminal yes, statistics are much more reliable than are those for illegitimacy. In the case of illegitimate births in papal countries, the priests have so many ways and means in their power of tempering with the statistics. <laughs> never believe a statistic that you didn't forge yourself, <laughs> that they are never reliable. In Ireland, when the Old Age Pension Act came into, co uh, into operation, government officials found it impossible to find the birth certificates of, or records of large numbers of applicants. Their births had never been registered. In the case of criminal statistics, these are taken from government records, with which priests have little opportunity of tempering. This fact is clearly demonstrated in the case of Ireland in this 20th century. The criminal statistics of Roman Catholic Ireland and of Irish Roman Catholics in England and Scotland are the worst in the whole British Empire by 50 to 400 percent. On the other hand, the registered legitimate births in Ireland are the lowest in the Empire. <laughs> Why? The priest in the confessional learns months beforehand of the unfortunate woman's fall and manipulates the whole subsequent proceedings so as to best serve the interests of the Roman Church. In the case of criminal records, priests have little opportunity of tampering with official records, hence the startling contrast between the two. The above facts demonstrate the value of the Sunday school in laying a firm foundation of truth and righteousness in the characters of our boys and girls. The countries with the high criminal records have few Sunday schools. They have crossings instead of Christ, ceremonial instead of sound doctrine. Interesting little footnote, huh? Now, how far are we into the recording today? I think we've reached about an hour, right? 55 we minutes. We sure have. 55 yeah. minutes. Maybe it's time to 
continue in 1515 and Tetzel uh, who was selling mm-hmm. indulgences all over Germany in the time and uh, really pissing off Martin Luther and then Martin Luther because we start the Reformation to do that another reading and by that uh, well stop for today and reflect a little bit on the things that I've read today because as far as I remember, I spoke about 95% of the time, so maybe now it's the time for you two brothers to say something about the, the stuff that I read, and let's discuss this a little bit for the last few minutes to get the hour full if we want to. Please, Brett and Michael. Thanks, uh-huh. Rick. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. Okay. Uh, thanks for the reading, Jörg. Um, I think it's always interesting to learn about uh, or, or other views on our history. And I think it's not only interesting for uh, your, the European listeners, but uh, for the listeners worldwide. So, uh, concerning that the, for example, the, the, the snake uh, cannon which they used, the, the, the Turkish soldiers, you see that there is uh, always something destructive coming out of the snake's mouth. It's on page uh, 29 in the book, uh, by the way. But uh, that's not my big point. I just uh, the entire time I listened to your voice reading this chapter, I thought about why is it that the people nowadays are not into studying their history and not into a Bible lecture especially. And I uh, came to my conclusion that uh, the reason simply is that uh, in the in the old days, in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, the people were poor and modest, and they were glad that they had something to um, talk about and something to to, uh, to to study very carefully, because there were not so many distractions, uh, so many. Distractions, yes, yeah, so many distractions around. Uh, but in the in, in in the new age, so-called new age now, 2019, as we are speaking of, uh, I think the people are growing up more indoctrinated, and uh, they have so many things around them, and are so overwhelmed by by the information. Uh, which is gathered around them, and they also they do not want to give up anything. Yeah, people are not um, the average John Doe is not poor anymore, so he does not want to give up. He is again worshiping the golden calf, and I think that's for me that's the main reason because their people are so uh, surrounded by luxury nowadays. They are so distracted, and for me, it's just it's just the money and the materialism that they are being led off the way instead of searching the truth. But they are so busy uh, comparing with with one another and uh, to have their worldly goods instead of uh, heavenly goods collecting heavenly goods and I think that's uh, quite my end comment it's just uh, the same story again for the love of money is the root of all evil and I'd like to hand it over to my brother Brett thank you yeah I've got to agree it uh, seems to be the way things have been uh, coerced into the satanic new age that we live in all right I have to agree with that and, um, you know, for many years, I've been a lover of really, really interesting music, electronic music, European electronic music, and very influenced by, uh, by that. And um, I've noticed this, uh, this New Age label that they put on all this music, and I never liked it, and I never understood it. And it kind of goes parallel with a lot of other things that have happened in life. You just don't understand why things are so until you take the time to really research it and study it. So, yeah, it's a long journey, long, long journey. But here we are, 2019, and we see a world that is very cloudy and very dark 
And uh, that's only because of man and the influence man has put upon his own people. And, well, here we are. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite striking. I don't think anyone can ignore the facts. Uh, they speak for themselves. And that's why we say you must do your own research, dear listener. And don't, you know, take our conclusions uh, to heart. Uh, you've got your own path to f- tread upon to come to your own uh, understanding. And that's really what we need to work on is our understanding. And that's what uh, Brett Norman YouTube channel is all about, is to empower you in, in just a different point of view. Uh, you don't have to agree with what we say. You don't have to like it. Just take it in, absorb it. Maybe later on you come back to it. Maybe you get it. Maybe you don't. Um, the point is we are here to just try and bring some clarity into this day and age that you know, as far as Yerk and Michael, I just don't see it anywhere. I, I just haven't found it anywhere, and I thirst for it. And I think there are others, there are a few others out there that thirst for it, like we do. And uh, that's what these broadcasts are all about. That's what these recordings are all about. And that's why we're studying this. And we just hope and pray that our Lord will uh, lead us into more truth and more understanding in the future. And I'm very, very grateful for both of you, Michael and Yerk. And I think that closes it up. Is there any other comments? Not for me. Okay, great. Look forward to seeing everybody next time. God bless. Bye-bye for now. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.